We lost nine people in the cholera epidemic. Six of them were young children. Jitendra's only son, Satish, survived, but two of the boy's closest friends died. Both of them had been enthusiastic students in my English class. The procession of children that ran with us, behind the biers carrying those little bodies, garlanded with flowers, wailed their grief so piteously that many strangers on the busy streets paused in prayer and felt the sudden burn and sting of tears. Parati survived the sickness, and Prabhakar nursed her for two weeks, sleeping outside her hut under a flap of plastic during the night. Sita took her sister Parvati's place at their father's chai shop, and whenever Johnny Cigar entered or passed the shop, her eyes followed him as slowly and stealthily as a walking leopard's shadow. Kala stayed for six days, the worst of it, and visited several times in the weeks that followed. When the infection rate dropped to zero and the crisis had passed for the most serious cases, I took a three-bucket shower, changed into clean clothes, and headed for the tourist beat in search of business. I was almost broke. The rain had been heavy, and the flooding in many areas of the city was as hard on the touts, dealers, guides, acrobats, pimps, beggars, and black marketeers who made their living on the street as it was on the many businessmen whose shops were submerged. Competition in Kolaba for the tourist dollar was cordial, but creatively emphatic. Yemeni street vendors held up falcon-crested daggers and hand-embroidered passages from the Quran. Tall, handsome Somalis offered bracelets made from beaten silver coins. Artists from Marissa displayed images of the Taj Mahal painted on dried, pressed papaya leaves. Nigerians sold carved ebony canes with stiletto blades concealed within their spiral shafts. Iranian refugees weighed polished turquoise stones by the ounce, and brass scales hung from the branches of trees. Drum sellers from Uttar Pradesh, carrying six or seven drums each, burst into brief, impromptu concerts if a tourist showed the faintest interest. Exiles from Afghanistan sold huge ornamental silver rings engraved with the Pashto script and encircling amethysts the size of pigeons' eggs. Threading through that commercial tangle were those who made their living servicing the businesses and the street traders themselves. Incense wavers bringing silken drifts of temple incense on silver trays, stove cleaners, mattress fluffers, ear cleaners, foot massagers, rat catchers, food and chai carriers, florists, laundrymen, water carriers, gas bottle men, and many others. Weaving their way between them and the traders and the tourists were the dancers, singers, acrobats, musicians, fortune tellers, temple acolytes, fire eaters, monkey men, snake men, bear handlers, beggars, self-flagellators, and many more who lived from the crowded street and returned to the slums at night. Every one of them broke the law in some way, eventually, in the quest for a faster buck. But the swiftest to the source, the sharpest eyed of all the street people, were those of us who broke the law professionally, the black marketeers. The street accepted me in that complex network of schemes and scammers for several reasons. First, I only worked the tourists who were too careful or too paranoid to deal with Indians. If I didn't take them, no one did. Second, no matter what the tourists wanted, I always took them to the appropriate Indian businessman. I never did the deals myself. And third, I wasn't greedy. My commissions always accorded with the standards set by decent, self-respecting crooks throughout the city. I made sure as well when my commissions were large enough to put money back into the restaurants, hotels, and begging bowls of the area. And there was something else, something far less tangible, but even more important, perhaps, than commissions and turf war sensitivities. The fact that a white foreigner, a man most of them took to be European, had settled so ably and comfortably in the mud near the bottom of their world was profoundly satisfying to the sensibility of the Indians on the street. In a curious mix of pride and shame, my presence legitimized their crimes. What they did from day to day couldn't be so bad if a Gora joined them in doing it. And my fall raised them up because they were no worse, after all, than Lin Baba, the educated foreigner who lived by crime and worked the street as they did. Nor was I the only foreigner who lived from the black market. There were European and American drug dealers, pimps, counterfeiters, con men, gem traders, and smugglers. 
Among them were two men who shared the name George. One was Canadian and the other was English. They were inseparable friends who'd lived on the streets for years. No one seemed to know their surnames. To make the distinction, they were known by their star signs, Scorpio George and Gemini George. The Zodiac Georges were junkies who'd sold their passports as the last valuable things they owned and then worked with the heroin travelers, tourists who came to India to binge hit heroin for a week or two before returning to the safety of their own countries. There were surprisingly large numbers of these tourists, and the Zodiac Georges survived from their dealings with them. The cops watched me and the Georges and the other foreigners who worked the streets, and they knew exactly what we were doing. They reasoned, truly enough, that we caused no violent harm, and we were good for business in the black market that brought them bribes and other benefits. They took their cut from the drug and currency dealers. They left us alone. They left me alone. On that first day after the cholera epidemic, I made about 200 US dollars in three hours. It wasn't a lot, but it's, I decided it was enough. The rain had squalled through the morning, and by noon it seemed to have settled into the kind of sultry, dozing drizzle that sometimes lasts for days. I was sitting on a bar stool and drinking a freshly squeezed cane juice under a striped awning near the President Hotel, not far from the slum, when Wikram ran in out of the rain. Hey Lynn, how you doing, man? Fuck this fucking rain yard. We shook hands, and I ordered him a cane juice. He tipped his flat, black flamenco hat onto his back, where it hung from a cord at his throat. His black shirt featured white embroidered figures down at the button strip at the front. The white figures were waving lassos over their heads. His belt was made from American silver dollar coins linked one to the other and fastened with a domed concho as a belt buckle. The black flamenco pants were embroidered with fine white scrolls down the outside of the leg and ended in a line of three small silver buttons. His Cuban-heeled boots had crossover loops of leather that fastened with buckles at the outside. Not really riding with it, huh? Oh shit, he spat. You heard about Letty and the horses? Jesus, man, that was fucking weeks ago, Yod. I haven't seen you in too fucking long. How's it going with Letty? Not great, he sighed as he said it, yet his smile was happy. But I think she's coming around, Yod. She's a very special kind of chick. She needs to get all the hating done, like, before she can kind of cruise into the loving part. But I'll get her, even if the whole world says I'm crazy. I don't think you're crazy to go after her. You don't? No, she's a lovely girl. She's a great girl. You're a nice guy, and you're more alike than people think. You both have a sense of humor, and you love to laugh. She can't stand hypocrites, and neither can you. And you're interested in life, I think, in pretty much the same way. I think you're a good couple, or at least you will be. And I think you'll get her in the end, Wikram. I've seen the way she looks at you, even when she's putting shit on you. She likes you so much that he has, she has to put you down. It's her way. Just stick with it, and you'll win her in the end. Lynn, listen, man. That's it. Fuck it. I like you. I mean, that's a fucking cool rave, Yacht. I'm going to be your friend from now on. I'm your fucking blood brother, man. If you need anything, you call on me. Is it a deal? Sure, I smile. It's a deal. He fell silent, staring out at the rain. His curly black hair had grown to his collar at the back and was trimmed at the front and sides. His mustache was fastidiously snipped and trimmed to little more than the thickness that a felt-tipped pen might have made. In profile, his face was imposing. The long forehead ended in a hawk-like nose and descended past a firm, solemn mouth to a prominent, confident jaw. When he turned to face me, it was his eyes that dominated, however, and his eyes were young, curious, and shimmering with good humor. You know, Lynn, I really love her, he said softly. He let his eyes drift downward to the pavement, and then he looked up again quickly. I really love that English chick. You know, Wickram, I really love it, I said, mimicking his tone of voice and the earnest expression on his face. I really love that cowboy shirt. What, this old thing? He cried, laughing with me. Fuck, man, you can have it. He jumped off the stool and began to unbutton his shirt. No, no, I was only joking. What's that? You mean you don't like my shirt? I didn't say that. So what's wrong with my fucking shirt? There's nothing wrong with your fucking shirt. I just don't want it. Too late, man, he bellowed, pulling his shirt from his back and throwing it at me. Too fucking late. He wore a black singlet under the shirt 
and the black hat was still hanging at his back. The cane juice crusher had a portable hi-fi at his stall. A new song from a hit Hindi movie started up. Hey, I love this song, Yad, Vikram cried out. Turn it up, Baba. Are, full karo. The juice wala obligingly turned the volume up to the maximum, and Vikram began to dance and sing along with the words. Showing surprisingly elegant and graceful skill, he swung out from under the crowded awning and danced in the lightly falling rain. Within one minute of his twirling, swaying dance, he lured other young men from the footpath, and there were six, seven, and then eight dancers laughing in the rain, while the rest of us clapped, hooped, and hollered. Turning his steps toward me once more, Vikram reached out to grasp my wrist with both of his hands, and then began to drag me into the dance. I protested and tried to fight him off, but many hands from the street assisted him, and I was pushed into the group of dancers. I surrendered to India, as I did every day then, and as I still do, every day of my life, no matter where I am in the world. I danced, following Wickram's steps, and the street cheered us on. The song finished after some minutes, and we turned to see Letty standing under the awning and watching us with open amusement. Wickram ran to greet her, and I joined them, shaking off the rain. Don't tell me, I don't want to know, she said, smiling but silencing Wickham with the raised palm of her hand. Whatever you do in the privacy of your own rain shower is your own business. Hello, Lynn. How are you, darling? Fine, Letty. Wet enough for you? Your rain dance seems to be working a treat. Carla was supposed to join me in Wickham right about now. We're going to the jazz concert at Mahim, but she's flooded in at the Taj. She just called me to let me know. The whole gateway's flooded. Limousines and taxis are floating about like paper boats, and the guests can't get out. They're stranded at the hotel, and our car is stranded there at all. Glancing around quickly, I saw that Robakira's cousin Shanto was still sitting in his taxi, parked with several others outside the restaurants where I'd seen him earlier. I checked my watch. It was 3.30. I knew that the local fishermen would all be back on shore with their catches. I turned to Wickram and Letty once more. Sorry, guys, gotta go. I pushed the shirt back into Wickram's hands. Thanks for the shirt, man. I'll grab it next time. Keep it for me. I jumped into Shanto's taxi, twirling the meter to the on position through the passenger window. Letty and Wickram waved as we sped past them. I explained my plan to Shanto on the way to the Kohli settlement adjacent to our slum. His dark, lined face creased in a weathered smile, and he shook his head in wonder, but he pushed the battered taxi a little faster through the short ride on the rain-drenched road. At the fisherman's settlement, I enlisted the support of Vinod, who was a patient at my clinic and one of Prabhakar's close friends. He selected one of his shorter punts, and we lifted the light, flat boat onto the roof of the taxi and sped back to the Taj Hotel area near the Radio Club Hotel. Shantu worked in his taxi 16 hours a day for six days every week. He was determined that his son and two daughters would know lives that were better than his own. He saved money for their education and for the substantial dowries he would be required to provide if the girls were to marry well. He was permanently exhausted and beset by all the torments, terrible and trivial, that poverty endures. Winod supported his parents, his wife, and five children from the fish that he hauled from the sea with his thin, strong arms. On his own initiative, he'd formed a cooperative with 20 other poor fishermen. That pooling of resources had provided a measure of security, but his income seldom stretched to luxuries such as new sandals or school books or a third meal in any one day. Still, when they knew what I wanted to do and why, neither Winod nor Shanto would accept any money from me. I struggled to give it to them, even trying to force the money down their, the fronts of their shirts, but they refused to allow it. They were poor, tired, worried men, but they were Indian, and any Indian man will tell you that although love might not have been invented in India, it was certainly perfected there. We put the long, flat punt down in the shallow water of the flooded road near the radio club, close to Anand's India guest house. Shantu gave me the oilskin cape he used to keep himself dry with, with whenever the taxi broke down, and the weathered black chauffeur's cap that was his good luck charm. He waved us up, off as we Winod and I struck out for the Taj Mahal Hotel. We pulled our way along the road that was usually busy with taxis, trucks, motorcycles, and private cars. The water grew deeper with every stroke of the poles, until at Best Street Corner, where the Taj Mahal Hotel complex began, it was already waist deep. 
The Taj had experienced such floods in the surrounding streets many times. The hotel was built upon a tall platform of bluestone and granite blocks, with ten marble steps leading up to each wide entrance. The floodwaters were deep that year. They reached to the second step from the top, and cars were floating, drifting helplessly, and bumping together near the wall surrounding the great arch of the Gateway of India Monument. We steered the boat directly to the steps of the main entrance. The foyer and doorways were crowded with people, rich businessmen watching their limousines bubble and drift into the rain, women in expensive local and foreign designer dresses, actors and politicians, and fashionable sons and daughters. Carla stepped forward as if she'd been expecting me. She accepted my hand and stepped into the punt. I threw the cape around her shoulders as she sat in the center of the boat and handed her the cap. She slipped it on with a raffish tilt of the cap's peak, and we set off. Winod sent us in a loop toward the gateway monument. As we entered its magnificent vaulted chamber, he began to sing. The monument produced a spectacular acoustic. His love song echoed and rang the bell in every heart that heard him. Winod brought us to the taxi stand at the Radio Club Hotel. I reached out to help Carla from the boat, but she jumped to the footpath beside me, and we held on to one another for a moment. Her eyes were a darker green beneath the peak of the cap. Her black hair glistened with raindrops. Her breath was sweet with cinnamon and caraway seed. We pulled apart, and I opened the door of a taxi. She handed me the cap and the cape, and took a seat in the back of the cab. She hadn't spoken a single word since I'd arrived with the boat. Then she simply addressed the driver. Mahim, she said. Chalo, Mahim area, let's go. She looked at me once more as the taxi drew away from the curb. There was a command or a demand in her eyes. I couldn't decide what it was. I watched the cab speed away. Winod and Shantou watched it with me and clapped their hands on my shoulders. He lifted Winod's boat back onto the roof of the taxi. As I took my seat beside Shantou, reaching out with my left arm to hold the long boat on the roof, I glanced up to see a face in the crowd. It was Rajan, Madame Joe's eunuch servant. He was staring at me. His face was a gargoyle mask of malevolence and hatred. That face remained with me all the way back to the Kodi settlement. But when we unloaded the boat and Shantou agreed to join Winod and me for dinner, I let the image of Rajan's malice melt into my memory. I ordered food from a local restaurant and it was delivered to us there on the beach, steaming hot in metal containers. We spread the containers out on an old piece of canvas sail and sat beneath a wide plastic awning to eat. Winod's parents, wife and five children took their places around the edge of the canvas sheet beside Shantou and me. Rain continued to fall, but the air was warm and a faint breeze from the bay slowly stirred the humid evening. Our shelter on the sandy beach beside the many long boats looked out to the rolling sea. We ate chicken biryani, malai kofta, vegetable korma, rice, curried, curried vegetables, deep fried pieces of pumpkin, potato, onion, and cauliflower, hot buttered naan bread, dal, papadams, and green mango chutney. It was a feast the delight that spilled from the eyes of the children while they ate their fill put starlight in our smiles as we watched them. When night fell, I rode back to Kolaba's tourist beat in a cab. I wanted to take a room for a few hours at the India Guest House. I wasn't worried about the sea form of the hotel. I knew that I wouldn't have to sign the register, and Anand wouldn't include me in his list of guests. The arrangement we'd agreed on months before, the same one that applied to most of the cheaper hotels in the city, allowed me to pay an hourly rent directly to him so that I could use the shower or conduct private business in one of the rooms from time to time. I wanted to shave. I wanted to spend a good half hour under a shower using too much shampoo and soap. I wanted to sit in a white tiled bathroom where I could forget the cholera and scrape and scrub the last few weeks off my skin. Oh, Lynn, so glad to see you, Anand muttered through clenched teeth as I walked into the foyer. His eyes were glittering with tension, and his long, handsome face was grim. We have a problem here. Come quick. He led me to a room off the main corridor. A girl answered the door and spoke to us in Italian. She was distraught and disheveled. Her hair was messed and matted with lint and what looked like food. Her thin nightdress hung askew, revealing the handspan of her ribs. 
She was a junkie, and she was stoned almost to sleep, but there was a numb, somnolent panic in her pleading. On the bed, there was a young man sprawled with one leg over the foot of the bed. He was naked to the waist, and his trousers were open at the front. One boot was discarded, and the other was still on his left foot. He was about 28 years old. He was dead. No pulse, no heartbeat, no breathing. The overdose had thrown his body down the long black well, and his face was as blue as the sky at 5 p.m. on the darkest day of winter. I hauled his body up onto the bed, and put a roll of sheet behind his neck. Bad business, Lynn, Anand said tersely. He stood with his back to the closed door, preventing anyone from entering. Ignoring him, I began cardiopulmonary resuscitation on the young man. I knew the drill too well. I'd pulled junkies out of overdoses, dozens of them, when I was a junkie myself. I'd done it 50, 80 times in my own country, pressing and breathing life into the living dead. I pressed to the young man's heart, willing it to beat, and breathed his lungs to their capacity for him. After 10 minutes of the procedure, he stuttered deep in his chest and coughed. I rested on my knees, watching to see if he was strong enough to breathe on his own. The breathing was slow, and then slower, and then it stopped in a hollow sigh. The sound was as flat and insentient as the air escaping from a fissure in layers of geyser stone. I began the CPR again. It was exhausting work, dragging his limp body back up the whole length of the well with my arms and my lungs. The girl went under twice while I worked on her boyfriend. Anand slapped at her and shook her awake. Three hours after I stepped into the hotel, Anand and I left the room. We were both soaked through with sweat, our shirts as wet as, we'd been stand as if we'd been standing in the rain that drummed and rattled beyond the windows. The couple was awake and sullen and angry with us, despite the girl's earlier plea for help, because we'd disturbed the pleasure of their stone. I closed the door on them, knowing that sometime soon, someone else in that city, or some other, would close a door on them forever. Every time junkies go down the well, they sink a little deeper, and it's just that little bit harder to drag them out again. Anand owed me one. I showered and shaved and accepted the gift of a freshly washed and ironed shirt. We sat in the foyer then and shared a chai. Some men like you less, the more they owe you. Some men only really begin to like you when they find themselves in your debt. Anand was comfortable with his obligation, and his handshake was the kind that good friends sometimes use in place of a whole conversation. When I stepped down to the street, a taxi pulled into the curb beside me. Ulla was in the back seat. Lynn, please, can you get in for some time? Worry and what might have been dread pushed her voice almost to a whine. Her lovely pale face was trapped in a fearful frown. I climbed in beside her, and the taxi pulled out slowly from the curb. The cab smelled of her perfume and the beady cigarettes that she constantly smoked. Si ta jao, she told the driver. Go straight ahead. I have a problem, then. I need some help. It was my night to be the white knight. I looked into her large blue eyes and resisted the impulse to make a joke or a flirtatious remark. She was afraid. Whatever had scared her still possessed her eyes. She was looking at me, but she was still staring at the fear. Oh, I'm sorry, she sobbed, breaking down suddenly and then pulling herself together just as swiftly. I didn't even say any hello to you. How are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. Are you doing good? You look very good. Her lilting German accent gave a fluttering music to her speech that pleased my ear. I smiled at her as the colored lights streamed across her eyes. I'm fine. What's the problem? I need someone to go with me, to be with me, at one o'clock after midnight, at Leopold's. I'll be there, and, and I need you to be there with me. Can you do it? Can you be there? Leopold's is shut at midnight. Yes, she said, her voice breaking again on the edge of tears. But I'll be there, in a taxi, parked outside. I'm meeting someone and I don't want to be alone. Can you be there with me? Why me? What about Medina or Maurizio? I trust you, Lynn. It won't take long, the meeting, and I'll pay you. I'm not asking you to help me for nothing. I'll pay you $500 if you'll just be there with me. Will you do it? I heard a warning deep within. We usually do when something worse than we can imagine is stalking us and set to pounce. Fate's way of beating us in a fair fight is to give us warnings that we hear but never heed. Of course I would help her. Ulla was Carla's friend, and I was in love with Carla. I would help her for Carla's sake, even if I didn't like her. 
And I did like Ulla. She was beautiful, and she was just naive enough, just sanguine enough, to stop sympathy slipping into pity. I smiled again and asked the driver to stop. Sure, don't worry, I'll be there. She leaned across and gave me a kiss on the cheek. I got out of the cab. She put her hands on the window's edge and leaned out. Misty rain settled on her long eyelashes, forcing her to blink. You'll be there, promise? 1 a.m., I said firmly. Leopold's, I'll be there. You promise? Yeah, I laughed, I promise. The taxi pulled away and she called out with a plaintive urgency that seemed harsh and almost hysterical in the stillness of the night. Don't let me down then. I walked back toward the tourist beat aimlessly, thinking about Ola and the business, whatever it was, that her boyfriend Medena was involved in with Maurizio. Didier had told me they were successful, they were making money, but Ola seemed afraid and unhappy. And there was something else that Didier had said, something about danger. I tried to remember the words he'd used. What were they? Terrible risk, great violence. My mind was still shuffling through those thoughts when I realized that I was in Carla's street. I passed her ground floor apartment. The wide French doors leading directly from the street were open. A desultory breeze riffled the gauze curtains and I saw a soft yellow light, a candle glowing within. The rain grew heavier but a restlessness I couldn't fight or understand kept me walking. Minaud's love song, the song that rang bells in the dome of the Gateway Monument, was running on a loop in my mind. My thoughts floated back to the boat, sailing on the surreal lake that the moon monsoon had made of the street. The look in Carla's eyes, commanding, demanding, drove the restlessness to a kind of fury in my heart. I had to stop, sometimes in the rain, to draw deep breaths, I was choking with love and desire. There was anger in me and pain. My fists were clenched. The muscles of my arms and chest and back were tight and taut. I thought of the Italian couple, the junkies in Anand's hotel, and I thought of death and dying. The black and brooding sky finally ruptured and cracked. Lightning ripped into the Arabian Sea, and thunder followed with deafening applause. I began to run. The trees were dark, their leaves wet through. They looked like small black clouds themselves, those trees, each one shedding its shower of rain. The streets were empty. I ran through puddles of fast-flowing water, reflecting the lightning-fractured sky. All the loneliness and all the love I knew collected and combined in me, until my heart was as swollen with love for her as the clouds above were swollen with their mass of rain. And I ran. I ran. And somehow, I was back in that street, back at the doorway to her house. And then I stood there, clawed by lightning, my chest heaving with a passion that was still running in me while my body stood still. She came to the open doors to look at the sky. She was wearing a thin, white, sleeveless nightgown. She saw me standing in the storm. Our eyes met and held. She came through the doors, down two steps, and walked toward me. Thunder shook the street, and lightning filled her eyes. She came into my arms. We kissed. Our lips made thoughts, somehow, without words, the kind of thoughts that feelings have. Our tongues writhed and slithered in their caves of pleasure, tongues proclaiming what we were, human lovers. Lips slid across the kiss, and I submerged her in love, surrendering and submerging in love myself. I lifted her in my arms and carried her into the house, into the room that was perfumed with her. We shed our clothes on the tiled floor, and she led me to her bed. We lay close, but not touching. In the storm-lit darkness, the beaded sweat and raindrops on her arm were like so many glittering stars, and her skin was like a span of night sky. I pressed my lips against the sky and licked the stars into my mouth. She took my body into hers, and every movement was an incantation. Our breathing was like the whole world, chanting prayers. Sweat ran in rivulets to ravines of pleasure. Every movement was a satin skin cascade. Within the velvet cloaks of tenderness, our backs convulsed in quivering heat, pushing heat, pushing muscles to complete what minds begin and bodies always win. I was hers, she was mine. My body was her chariot, and she drove it into the sun. Her body was my river, and I became the sea. 
the wailing moan that drove our lips together at the end was the world of hope and sorrow that ecstasy rings from lovers as it floods their souls with bliss. The still and softly breathing silence that suffused and submerged us afterward was emptied of need and want and hunger and pain and everything else except the pure, ineffable exquisiteness of love. Oh, shit! What? Oh, Jesus, look at the time! What? What is it? I've got to go, I said, jumping out of the bed and reaching for my wet clothes. I've got to meet someone at Leopold's, and I've got five minutes to get there. Now? You're going now? I have to. Leopold's will be shut, she frowned, sitting up in the bed and leaning against a little hill of pillows. I know, I muttered, pulling on my boots and lacing them. My clothes and boots were soaking wet, but the night was still humid and warm. The storm was easing, and the breeze that had stirred the languid air was dying. I knelt beside the bed and leaned across to kiss the soft skin of her thigh. I've got to go. I gave my word. Is it that important? A twitch of irritation creased my forehead with a frown. I was momentarily annoyed that she should press the point when I told her that I'd given my word. That should have been enough. But she was lovely in that moonless night, and she was right to be annoyed, while I wasn't. I'm sorry, I answered softly, running my hand through her thick black hair. How many times had I wanted to do that, to reach out and touch her when we'd stood together? Go on, she said quietly, watching me with a witch's concentration. Go. I ran to Arthur Bunder Road, through the deserted market. White canvas covers on the market stalls gave them the appearance of shrouded cadavers in the cool room of a moor. My footsteps running made scattered echoes as if ghosts were running with me. I crossed Arthur Bunder Road and entered Meerweather Road, running along that boulevard of trees and tall mansions with no sight or sound of a million people who passed there during each busy day. At the first crossroad, I turned left to avoid the flooded streets, and I saw a cop riding a bicycle ahead. I ran on in the center of the road, and a second bicycle cop pulled out of a dark driveway as I passed. When I was exactly halfway into the side street, the first police jeep appeared at the end of the street. I heard the second jeep behind me, and then the cyclists converged. The jeep pulled up beside me, and I stopped. Five men got out and surrounded me. There was silence for a few seconds. It was a silence of such delicious menace that the cops were almost drunk with it, and their eyes were lit with riot in the softly falling rain. What's happening? I asked Imarati. What do you want? Get in the jeep, the commander grunted in English. Listen, I speak Marathi, so can't we? I began, but the commander cut me off with a harsh laugh. We know you speak Marathi, motherfucker, he answered in Marathi. The other cops laughed. We know everything. Now get in the fucking jeep, you sister fucker, or we'll beat you with the lattes and then put you in. I stepped into the back of the covered jeep, and they sat me on the floor. There were six men in the back of the jeep, and they all had their hands on me. We drove the two short blocks to the Calaba police station, across the road from Leopold's. As we entered the police compound, I noticed that the street in front of Leopold's was deserted. Ola wasn't there, where she'd said she would be. Did she set me up, I wondered, my heart thumping with dread. That made no sense, but still the thought became a worm that gnawed through all the walls I put up in my mind. The night duty officer was a squat, overweight Maharashtrian who, like many of his colleagues in the police force, squeezed himself into a uniform that was at least two sizes too small for him. The thought occurred to me that the discomfort it must have caused might help to explain his evil disposition. There was certainly no humor in him or any of the ten cops who surrounded me, and I felt a perverse urge to laugh out loud as their scowling, heavy breathing silence persisted. Then the duty officer addressed his man and the laughter in me died. Take this motherfucker and beat him, he said matter-of-factly. If he knew that I spoke Marathi and could understand him, he gave no indication of it. He spoke to his men as if I wasn't there. Beat him hard. Give him a solid beating. Don't break any bones if you can help it, but beat him hard and then throw him into the jail with the others. I ran. I pushed through the circle of cops, cleared the landing outside the duty room in a single leap, and hit the gravel yard of the compound, running. It was a stupid mistake, and not the last I was to make in the next few months. Mistakes are like bad loves, Carla once said. 
The more you learn from them, the more you wish they'd never happened. My mistake that night took me to the front gate of the compound, where I collided with a roundup party and collapsed in a tangle of tied and helpless men. The cops dragged me back to the duty room, punching and kicking me all the way. They tied my hands behind my back with coarse hemp rope and removed my boots before tying my feet together. The short, fat duty officer produced a thick coil of rope and ordered his men to bind me with it from ankles to shoulders. Puffing and panting with his rage, he watched as I was trussed in so many coils of rope that I resembled an Egyptian mummy. The cops then dragged me to an adjoining room and hoisted me up to hang me at chest height from a hook, face down, with the hook jammed through several coils of rope at my back. Aeroplane, the duty officer growled through clenched teeth. The cops spun me around faster and faster. The hook held my bound hands in the bunch ropes and my head hung down, level with my drooping feet. I whirled and spun until I lost my sense of up or down in the twirling room. Then the beatings began. Five or six men hit my spinning body as hard and as often as they could, cracking their cane lattes against my skin. The stinging blows struck with piercing pain through the ropes and on my face, arms, legs, and feet. I could sense that I was bleeding. The screaming rose up in me, but I clenched my jaws and gave the pain no sound of my own. I wouldn't let them have it. I wouldn't let them hear me scream. Silence is the tortured man's revenge. Hands reached out, stopping my body, holding it still, while the room continued to whirl. Then they spun me in the opposite direction, and the beating began again. When their sport was done, they dragged me up the metal steps to the lockup, the same metal steps I'd climbed with Rabakar when I tried to help Kano's bear handlers. Will someone come to help me? I asked myself. No one had seen my arrest on the deserted street, and no one knew where I was. Ulla, if she came to Leopold's at all, if she wasn't actually involved in my arrest, wouldn't know that I'd been arrested. And Carla, what could Carla think but that I'd abandoned her after we'd made love? She wouldn't find me. Prison systems are black holes for human bodies. No light escapes from them and no news. With that mysterious arrest, I'd vanished into one of the city's darkest black holes. I'd disappeared from the city as completely as if I'd caught a plane to Africa. And why was I arrested? The questions buzzed and swarmed in my whirling mind. Did they know who I really was? If they didn't know, if it was something else, if it had nothing to do with who I really was, there would still be questions, identification procedures, maybe even fingerprint checks. My prints were on file all over the world through the Interpol agency. It was only a question of time before my real identity emerged. I had to get a message out to someone. Who could help me? Who was powerful enough to help me? Karabai, Lord Abdel Kader Khan. With all of his contacts in the city, especially in the Kalaba area, he would surely find out that I'd been arrested. In time, Karabai would know. Until then, I had to sit tight and try to get a message out to him. Trussed up in the mummifying ropes, dragged up the hard metal stairs one bruising bump at a time, I forced my thoughts to settle on that mantra, and I repeated it, to the thumping beat of my heart. Get a message to Kadabai. Get a message to Kadabai. At the top landing of the stairs, they threw me into the long prison corridor. The duty officer ordered prisoners to remove the ropes from my body. He stood in the gateway of the lockup, watching them with his fists on his hips. At one point, he kicked me two, three times to encourage them to work faster. When the last of the ropes was removed and passed through to the guards, he ordered them to lift me and stand me up, facing him at the open gate. I felt their hands numbly on my deadened skin, and I opened my eyes through blood to see his grimace of a smile. He spoke to me in Marathi and then spat in my face. I tried to raise my arm to hit back at him, but the other prisoners held me fast. Their hands were gentle but firm. They helped me into the archway of the first open cell room and eased me to the concrete floor. I looked up to see his face as he shut the gate. Loosely but accurately translated, he'd said to me, you're fucked, your life is over. I saw the steel bars of the gate swing shut and felt the creeping coldness numb my heart. Metal slammed against metal. The keys jangled and turned in the log. I looked into the eyes of the men around me, the dead eyes and the frenzied, the resentful eyes and the fearing. Somewhere deep inside me, 
A drum began to beat. It might have been my heart. I felt my body, my whole body, tense and clench as if it was a fist. There was a taste, thick and bitter, at the back of my mouth. I struggled to swallow it down, and then I knew, I remembered. It was the taste of hatred. My hatred, theirs, the guards, and the world's. Prisons are the temples where devils learn to pray. Every time we turn the key, we twist the knife of fate, because every time we cage a man, we close him in with hate.